A myth repeated countless times by school textbooks and the media is that Herbert Hoover was a champion of laissez-faire whose response to the Great Depression was to do nothing. In this video I want to explain exactly why that is not the case. I will not be looking at the causes of the Wall Street crash of 1929 or indeed at the deleterious effects of Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal after 1933. Those are both videos for a different day. I want to focus on what Herbert Hoover did in the aftermath of 1929 and the effects of those actions. First though, let's take a look at some stats to underline just how bad the worst ever economic crisis in American history was. Strap in. So, in production, between 1929 and 1933, money gross national product fell by 46.4%. To put this into context, for the entirety of the rest of the 20th century, there is no other year in which GMP declines at all. Real output per capita fell by 31%. Auto production in 1932 was 75% below the 1929 peak, with similar reductions in output across virtually every other major consumer durable good. Production of consumer durables fell by 50%. Producer durables decreased by 67%. New construction fell by 78%. Prices fell from between 22% and 31%. Wholesale prices dropped by 30% between 1929 and 1933. And what about the workers? Well, unemployment peaked at 25% and it is estimated that of those in work, one in three were working reduced hours. In business, there was a 13.5% decrease in real stock of equipment in all industries from 1929 to 1932. Gross domestic investment fell by 90%. There were losses of over $2.5 billion. That's $48.46 billion today, adjusted for inflation in the private banking sector alone. After-tax profits for corporations during this period was less than zero in 1931, 1932, and 1933. In 1932, corporations posted losses of $3.4 billion, which is about $62.54 billion today. Rental income fell by 60%. Prices for farm products dropped by 50%, and thousands of farmers lost their properties. Real disposable income decreased by 28%, and the stock index dropped by 80%. Now, contrary to his reputation, Hoover did more than any previous president to intervene in the economy, which was against the advice of Andrew Mellon, his treasury staff, who famously said he should liquidate labor, liquidate stocks, liquidate the farmers, liquidate real estate to purge the rottenness from the economy. This was probably correct advice. It's what Warren G. Harding did in the early 20s and the economy came roaring back, which I'll touch on again in a moment. But Hoover listened to other advisors and his instincts were always towards intervention. Let's take a look at what he did. Well, the first thing he did was the so-called jawboning uh, of business to maintain high wages. Hoover jawboned companies to maintain high wages and not to drop them, which they did in cooperation with the government. Henry Ford, for example, complied by actually raising wages. As Murray Rothbard put it, characteristic of all Hoover's interventions was the velvet glove on the mailed fist. That is, the businessman would be exhorted to adopt voluntary measures that the government desired but implicit was the threat that if business did not volunteer properly, compulsory controls would soon follow. Those that did not comply would face consequences, so naturally, given that they were already losing money, most of these companies had to lay off workers to compensate for the high wages. As I always say, the real minimum wage is zero. This helpful graph from Richard K. Vedder and Lowell E. Galloway plots how wages responded to the recession of 1920 to 1921, during which, remember, Warren G. Harding did nothing. And it also shows how 
uh, wages responded under Hoover. Notice how wages were allowed to fall under Harding and how the unemployment number recovers. In fact, under Harding, the unemployment rate was 11.7% in 1921. It fell to 6.7% in 1922 and then to 2.4% in 1923. He did nothing. Ironically, his Secretary of Commerce, a certain Herbert Hoover, wanted to intervene. And in fact, in that role, was extremely active during the 1920s, siding with the labor unions against US steel companies and introducing an eight hour working day, despite the fact that most workers preferred working the 12 hour day because it meant more pay, as well as the fact that for owners, production would suffer. As Murray Rothbard writes, this and other arguments were swept away by the wave of emotionalism whipped up over the issue. The forces of the social gospel hurled anathemas, social justice and social action committees of Protestant, Catholic and Jewish organisations set up a clamour on issues about which they knew virtually nothing, attaching a quantitative codicil to the qualitative moral codes of the Bible. They did not hesitate to declare that the 12-hour day was morally indefensible. Hoover also sided with the rail unions and passed the Railway Labour Act to ensure that the lobbying of unions had a louder voice. This was because Hoover, during this period, was an advocate of a new theory of economics which put America's relative success down to its higher wages. This is a speech he gave on May the 12th, 1926. Not so many years ago, the employer considered it was in his interest to use the opportunities of unemployment and immigration to lower wages, irrespective of other considerations. The lowest wages and longest hours were then conceived as the means to obtain lowest production costs and largest profits. But we are a long way on the road to new conceptions. The very essence of great production is high wages and low prices, because it depends on a widening consumption only to be obtained from the purchasing power of high real wages and increased standards of living. And the intelligentsia at this time, unsurprisingly, were enamoured with Hoover's apparently scientific new approach to the economy. In 1929, two enthusiastic economists wrote, the plan is business guided by measurements instead of hunches. It is economics for an age of science, economics worthy of the new president. So what happened under Hoover when he became president, faced with a new recession on which he could put all his new scientific theories into practice? Well, unemployment went from 9% just after the Wall Street crash to a staggering 28.3% in March of 1933. But this was not produced entirely by Hoover's jawboning over wages. He was to make many other interventions. Let us start with the worst. That was undoubtedly the Smoot-Hawley Tariff Act of 1930. This was the most protectionist legislation in US history, which effectively closed US borders to trade and to foreign goods. Uh, it ignited an international trade war. The thinking behind this was that it would force Americans to buy more goods made at home, which would solve the unemployment problem. Naturally, foreign companies could no longer operate and most of them withdrew, taking their jobs and dollars with them. Foreign countries also retaliated with their own tariffs and so the US also lost most of its export markets. This was a massive self-inflicted wound and one of the stupidest economic moves in all of history, with farmers especially badly hit, losing a third of their markets. As agriculture collapsed, the banking sector failed and virtually the whole economy imploded. The Smoot-Hawley Act turned a regular boom and bust stock market recession, albeit a very severe one, not only into the worst depression on record, but also into an international depression. As most other countries followed suit and erected their own protectionist trade barriers with similarly disastrous consequences. If you want to see the effect of the Smoot-Hawley tariff in context, 
Look at this table again. It was passed in June 1930, ironically after six consecutive months where the rate of unemployment was actually decreasing. Let me show it to you in this graph to make it even clearer. Let's zoom in. It's very obvious that the Smoot-Hawley Act is responsible for a sharp increase in unemployment after June 1930. But Hoover's interventions did not end there. He massively increased government spending. From 1930 to 1931, the government share of GMP increased by one third as he released funds for subsidies and relief schemes. He gave hundreds of millions of dollars to farmers whose markets he just destroyed. Robert P. Murphy provides some great graphs to illustrate the point that Hoover increased spending further. Murray Rothbard, who counts all government spending as consumption with zero net contribution to the economy, estimates that the government was destroying about 24.8% of the gross private product by 1932. But that's not all. Hoover passed a raft of interventionist legislation after this point, including the Agricultural Marketing Act of 1929, which established a federal farm board to stabilize prices, aka setting them artificially above or below market rates, the Davis-Bacon Act of 1931, mandating eight-hour workdays for government contractors. He seemed to be very fond of the eight-hour working day. The Norris-Lagarda Act of 1932, which banned yellow dog contracts and effectively forced employers to accept unionization. Uh, a yellow dog contract was uh, basically uh, an agreement between the employer and the employee that the employee would not join a union. Uh, the Revenue Act of 1932, which was used to raise taxes, it doubled income tax for most Americans. The top rate of tax increased from 24% to 63%. The Reconstruction Finance Corporation Act of 1932, which was used to bail out failing banks and to promote government secured lending. It also abolished credit limits. Uh, the Emergency Relief and Construction Act 1932, which was a $2 billion public work scheme, uh, effectively a slew of make work labor projects to create artificial jobs. Uh, Glass Siegel Act of 1932, which allowed f the Federal Reserve to increase inflation and to pump credit into the system. And you've already seen the numbers, you've already seen the effects of all of this. Did any of it work? No, it didn't. It made everything worse. Vedder and Galloway's conclusion after considering all of the evidence is damning. Analysis of the literature and the empirical evidence leads to an inescapable conclusion. The failure of money wages to fall in the downturn beginning in the fall of 1929 was largely a consequence of public policy intervention by President Hoover and his political allies. As a consequence of this intervention, real wages rose rather than fell, and unemployment increased to previously unattained levels. The Great Depression was not a tragic example of market failure, as is conventionally believed, but rather an example of government failure. It can be argued that the failure of the academic community, government policymakers, and the general public to realize this has become one of America's greatest mistakes. So you can see that Hoover was not a free market champion. And it is also a myth that FDR, that is Franklin Roosevelt, faced him on an interventionist platform in 1932. He didn't. As Lawrence W. Reed recounts, his opponent in the 1932 election, Franklin Roosevelt, didn't think so. During the campaign, Roosevelt blasted Hoover for spending and taxing too much, boosting the national debt, choking off trade and putting millions on the dole. He accused the president of reckless and extravagant spending, of thinking that we ought to center control of everything in Washington as rapidly as possible, and of presiding over the greatest spending administration in peacetime in all of history. Roosevelt's running mate, John Nance Garner, charged that Hoover was leading the country down the path of socialism. So there we have it. FDR didn't run on the New Deal. 
He ran on a pledge to cut taxes, to put an end to tariffs and to scrap prohibition laws. Anyway, more on FDR another time. That's a whole, you know, it's a continuation of this story, really. But the bottom line is that your school probably lied to you about Herbert Hoover as a champion of laissez-faire. Now get out. And a very special thanks to The Crimson Satyr, Sir Percy Blakeney, Andrew, Binary Surfer, Hornito Jones, Glenn Raymond, Kuzga, Ginger Bill, Michael Burt, Time Stealer, Tragic Vision, Blake Barrows, Holy Spatula, The Ambivalent Onion, and Edward Darrow.